Welcome to the Russian History Podcast, Episode 75, Mikhail Bakunin, the Collectivist Anarchist. First off, I'd like to apologize to my regular listeners for missing the past week, but the holidays and work, also known as the real world, caused me to fall behind. But just to give you a heads up this time, I'll be taking next week off to go to Texas to visit my daughter, but we'll be back on January 21st to resume our podcast series on Joseph Stalin. If you noticed, the title of today's podcast is changed slightly, as will those that follow after I'm done with Vladimir Putin. I'll be shifting to focusing on people and events separate from the rulers of Russia. Also, Today's podcast is dedicated to my late Russian history professor, Dr. Paul Average. And if anybody wants to know a little bit more about him, his last name is spelled A-V-R-I-C-H. He taught a class in anarchism, which was one of the more exciting classes we took in history, aside from uh, Russian history. But because of that, it brings us to our man of the day, Mikhail Bakunin the father of collectivist anarchism. Born May 30th, 1814, to a minor noble family, Mikhail Bakunin's writings were to inspire revolutionaries from the Russian tyrant Stalin, the 1893 French bomber Auguste Vélant, to the founder of the American Black Panthers, Eldridge Cleaver, and to some of today's Occupy movement. All of this from a man who was destined at birth to become a lifelong military man in service to the Tsar of all the Russias. When Mikhail was a young boy, the options for an, any adult career, you might say, for an eldest son of a minor noble, or really any non-Romanov, was really limited. You could become a bureaucrat in the service of the Tsar, an officer in armed services of the Tsar, or a cleric in the church in whose service of God and the Tsar was your life. Of course, you could move up or down the ranks based on the changes placed into effect in 1722 when Peter the Great created the Table of Ranks. Each rank or chini placed a noble into a position supposedly based purely on merit. Most nobles entered at the bottom rung, or the 14th chin, when they started their careers, but it was only at the 8th rank did the rank become hereditary, which came with privileges and advantages, such as owning land and, more importantly, serfs. The Bakunin family first came onto the scene in the 16th century as pomoschiki, or landowners, who also owned serfs, but the position was not hereditary at the time, but at the whim of the Tsar, as the family was a newly minted noble family. Under Peter the Great, they achieved the eighth chin, and their titles were secured. Mikhail's great-grandfather, Vasily Bakunin, served under Empress Elizabeth and reached the fourth chin, as did his grandfather, Mikhail, under Catherine the Great. His father, the youngest son of his family was considered too ill of health to enter into the harsh military service in Russia, so he was sent to Italy at the age of nine. Alexander Bakunin eventually studied at the University of Padua, which gave him a far more liberal education than those who stayed behind in Russia. In his homeland, political thought was suppressed if it deviated from absolute monarchism. But with Alexander being outside of Russia, revolutionary ideals were openly discussed. This is especially true after the events in France on July 14, 1789, with the storming of the Bastille and the coming French Revolution. Because of the outcome of the French Revolution, which Alexander supported intellectually, his family was to be brought up with liberal teachings. While believing in liberté, égalité, et fraternité, Alexander Bakunin could not bring those ideals into practice 
with his serfs, or souls, on his family's 4,000-acre estate in Priamokino. While he hated the horrible conditions in which the serf lived, he had no intention of freeing his 2,000 souls. Mikhail Bakunin's mother, Varvara, was a typical Russian noble mother, cold, vain, and powerless within the family structure. Alexander would set the rules. One was like not pushing his children into religious beliefs against Varvara's uh, sense of uh, what the family should do. But, quote, it was an attempt to show them that religion is the only basis for all virtue and our entire good fortune. Mikhail was not only brought up by his parents, but by the events that occurred during his life. His birth, May 30th, 1814, was the day that the Treaty of Paris was signed, ending the war against Napoleon. The men who returned to Russia were forever changed, having seen how the rest of Europe lived, and how backward Russia was. Since almost all the officers were in the noble class, it was the nobles who would discuss changing Russian society. Alexander Bakunin, although not an officer, would be one such noble. After the death of Alexander I, the Decemberist revolt in 1825 showed that many in the military were unsatisfied with the Tsarist regime, and with the ascension of the ultra-reactionary Nicholas I, things just got worse. The Tsar restarted the secret police to ferret out any and all radicals. The notorious Third Section, as it was called, had informants and spies everywhere, which caused the education of the Bakunin children to go from liberal to reactionary. This was done to protect the family and to make sure that the children would become loyal servants of the Tsar. But it was too late. The children could see that things needed changing, but to stop his son Mikhail from further radicalization, Alexander Bakunin sent his 14-year-old child to artillery officer school in St. Petersburg. Staying with his uncle and aunt at first, then the military barracks, Mikhail bristled at the situation, as his relatives were deeply religious and dogmatic, so he began to rebel. Over the years at the military academy, as hard as he tried, he just didn't fit into the army way of life. In 1824, at the age of 20, he was, quote, expelled from school for poor grades and assigned to barracks on the Polish frontier. By 1835, he left the service and headed to Moscow to hopefully study philosophy. At this time, he was embroiled in a spat with his family over the arranged marriage of his sister, who was also known as Varvara. He sided with his sister that a loveless marriage was wrong, or as he put it, quote, To marry a man whom you do not love, to marry out of calculation, even if you do not feel revulsion for him, even when he has merited your respect, is wrong. He went on to say, quote, Marriage without calculation is prostitution. Bakunin began to read works by the leading philosophers of his time, like Goethe, Hegel, Schiller, and E.T.A. Hoffmann. He surrounded himself with radical thinkers like Akasakov, Chadayev, and Ogarev, along with the influential socialist Alexander Herzen. It is then in 1840 Mikhail Bakunin headed off to Berlin to study the socialist movement, which he embraced wholly. From there, he headed to Dresden, where he became friends with Arnold Ruge. The Russian secret police became aware of Bakunin's revolutionary leanings and ordered him home. Refusing, the government confiscated some of his property in Russia. Instead of heading home, he headed to Zurich, Switzerland, for a six-month stay until the police pressure got too hot which caused him to head to Brussels. In 1844, Bakunin headed to Paris, where he met Karl Marx and the anarchist Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, who had a great influence on the young Mikhail. 
In December of that year, Tsar Nicholas I signed a decree stripping Bakunin of his noble standing, confiscating any land in his name, and condemning him to exile in Siberia should he ever be captured by Russian authorities. 1848 rolled around, and revolution throughout Europe was in the air, and Bakunin was in the midst of it. But trouble was brewing as the Russian embassy began to circulate rumors that Mikhail was an undercover agent. Karl Marx took the rumors as the truth, and so began the animosity between the two men. Involved deeply in the May Uprising in Dresden in 1849, he was eventually captured and condemned to death. He was then sent to Austria, and then, in 1851, he was handed to the Russians and taken to the notorious Peter and Paul Fortress. There, Count Orloff, on orders of Tsar Nicholas I, demanded a written confession. Bakunin answered the order thusly, quote, You want my confession? But you must know that a penitent sinner is not obliged to implicate or reveal the misdeeds of others. I have only the honor and the conscience that I have never betrayed anyone who has confided in me, and this is why I will not give you any names. Bakunin spent three years in the fortress. Then he was sent to the prison at Schlisselburg, where Ivan VI was previously murdered and Lenin's brother was later hanged. In 1855, Nicholas I died, and there was a belief that the reform-minded Alexander II would free him and send him into exile instead. The Tsar instead personally removed his name from the amnesty list. His mother pleaded with the Tsar to free her son, which worked as on February 1857 he was sent into exile in the western Siberian town of Tomsk. He met and married Anatonia Kwiatowski in early 1858 when he met her there. In Siberia, Makunin met with his second cousin, General Nikolai Moravyov Amursky who was the long-standing governor of eastern Siberia. He was a liberal who was disenchanted with the Tsar over the way they treated his territory. Eventually, Moravyov was replaced by, replaced by an even more liberal man, General Alexander Dondukov Kosakov. An idea around them was bandied about to create a United States of Siberia which would eventually become part of America and become the United States of Siberia and America. But alas, nothing came of it. Bakunin, by 1861, at the age of 47, wanted out of Russia, and he accomplished that when he snuck out of the country on an American boat, the SS Vickery, which made it to the Japanese island of Hokkaido. From there, he boarded another ship, which made it to San Francisco on October 15th, he then headed to Panama, crossed the Isthmus, and went on ship to New York City. Amazingly, having traveled halfway around the world, he did not stay put, as he immediately headed to London to get together with his old friend Alexander Herzen. Bakunin was excited by the revolution going on in Italy, led by Giuseppe Garibaldi. He wanted to use the Italian example to stimulate revolution first in Poland, then in his native Russia. He made it to Italy on January 14, 1864. He began to create a secret organization known as the Alliance of Revolutionary Socialists. It is also when he began to write about his anarchist points of view, which culminated in his influential work, Catechism of a Revolutionary, published in 1866. In it, he first states his rejection of religion and the state, advocating, quote, the absolute rejection of every authority, including that which sacrifices freedom for the convenience of the state. He also stated, quote, liberty without socialism is privilege. Socialism without liberty is slavery and brutality. From here, he was to become one of the most important people at the first international Geneva Conference, which brought together many of the world's leading socialists and revolutionaries. In September of 1867, 
He rose up to speak when, quote, the cry passed from mouth to mouth, Bakunin! Garibaldi, who was in the chair, stood up, advanced a few steps, and embraced him. This solemn meeting of two old and tried warriors of the revolution produced an astonishing impression. Everyone rose, and there was a prolonged and enthusiastic clapping of hands. Still, he began to split with Karl Marx again, until he was expelled from the International, which Bakunin had actually helped to form in Italy and Spain. From 1869 to 1870, he dallied with Sergei Nechev, but distanced himself from the man when Sergei began to exhibit a paranoiac behavior. By 1872, he was the chief thorn in Karl Marx's side, as, as his opponent's belief in the concept of a dictatorship of the proletariat was a dangerous step towards just another form of autocracy, who would be quoted as saying, If you took the most ardent revolutionary, vested him in absolute power, within a year he would be worse than the Tsar himself. So he foresaw the ascension of Stalin some fifty years ahead of his time. Just four years later, on July 1st, 1876, Mikhail Bakunin died of natural causes at the age of 62. His many years in prison in Russia and his time in exile in Siberia took their toll on the man. His influence, though, would extend well beyond his years of life. Some good, some bad. But he was a man of conviction who truly believed that if religion and state rule were abolished, that only then could the good nature of men and women really come about with a just society being created. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Please join us at Facebook at the Russian Rulers History Podcast, where you can post a question, make a comment, or a suggestion there. But you can also go to russianrulers.podhoster.com and do the same. But as always, das vidanya i spasiba bolshoya.